that you allow us to take part in today and ask that you bring your spirit down to guide us as we dive into the word and that we hear the sermon from Brother Cal. Thank you for today, Jesus. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, we're back in Ephesians this morning. We are back in Ephesians this morning. If y'all encourage the preacher every now and then, I promise he'll do better. Um, We're in Ephesians chapter 2, and I want to read verses 19 through 22 uh, for us. And, you know, we we hadn't been in Ephesians in a couple of weeks, and... um, I just so appreciated the service last week outdoors. It was really good, and a lot of people put in a lot of hours to get that done. And we're going to do that again maybe this fall sometime, maybe even over at Liberty Park. Um, I'm looking forward to And we learned a lot during that, uh, that day. Uh, we should have started probably at 7 a.m. Um, because by the time we got started, it was hot, hot, hot. But it was a good day, and just, just good. So we had, I don't know how many folks we had from Kenwood last Sunday, but it was great to have them with us. And uh, <clears throat> so anyways, if you have found Ephesians chapter 2 um, and verse 19, let's stand as we honor God's Word if you can. I know we've been up and down, but that's okay. Now. Therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. Aren't you glad you're not a stranger? Aren't you glad you're not a foreigner? Or as we used to say, a foreigner. But fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And may God add his blessing to the reading and the teaching and preaching of his word this morning. Please be seated. Now, in the Old Testament, God dwelt uh, early on in the tabernacle. And then in later years, God dwelt in a place called the temple. And, you know, so where does God dwell today? Well, in a real sense, God still lives and dwells in a building, but it's a much different building than what we see in those structures in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So I want to talk to you for the next few minutes about God's building. Um, and, and specifically, I want to just lay out three truths for you. The, the foundation of God's building um, and, and the construction of God's building and the habitation of God's building. And all of those come out of the, come out of the text this morning. So first, let's... Let's look at the foundation of God's building. And I want to say this up front. The foundation of God's building is completed. It's finished. It's done. Aren't you glad that the foundation's done? Now, any any good contractor will tell you and, and know that just automatically that in order to put up a building of any kind, you first got to do what? Lay a good foundation, right? And we know that the foundation of the church is built on whom? The Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18? On this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And and here's another verse over in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 11. And I really like this one. I ran across it this week in my study. 
and I think it really, it really points to what we're all about. For no, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation of the church. And, and you can't build a church on anything else but Jesus. You don't build the church on the pastor. You don't build the church on the music. You don't build the church on programs. The church is built on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. Jesus is the foundation of the church. Look at your neighbor and say, that's right. So why does Paul say that there in in verse um, 20, he says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Why does Paul say that the that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets? That's a good question. Because it just at a at a glance, at a reading, it looks like that's what he's saying. It's kind of contradictory. But can I just tell you, there are no contradictions in Scripture. We've got misunderstandings, but there's no contradictions in Scripture because it's inerrant, it's infallible, it's authoritative for our lives. So Jesus selected 12 men to be his apostles. And the word apostle means the sent out one. The apostles were sent out. Um, And and, and most of the, the apostles, by the way, were prophets. Well, what was a prophet all about? Well, a prophet was a man who was called of God to spread the word of God. And so what were the apostles and the prophets doing? Most of the apostles were prophets. They were sent out to spread the word of God. And, and, and so having said that, let me say that these men were God's gift to the church. Now, look at Ephesians 4 and verse 11. And he himself, Ephesians 4, 11, and he himself, who is he himself? That's right. Gave some to be what? Apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And so God's gift to the church were gifted men, apostles and prophets and evangelists and some pastors and teachers. But the apostles and prophets' main function, they were to be sent out with the word of God, to spread the word of God. That, that, was, that was their, they carried on the foundational work of Christ Jesus. Now we get, begin to make sense. Look at Ephesians 3 and verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit, capital S, to his holy apostles and prophets. So that tells you right there the apostles and prophets had a special assignment. They were called out of God. They were sent out by God as the Holy Spirit. And and the word holy means set apart. Are are y'all tracking with me this morning? Everybody's tracking. I know we hadn't got coffee yet, but it's coming. Um, And and so they they spoke the word of God as, as the Holy Spirit inspired it. And they also wrote the word of God down. Aren't you glad somebody wrote the word of God down? I mean... Most of these apostles and prophets had what you call an amanuensis, someone who could record what the prophet was speaking when when the Spirit of God hit them and they began to share the Word of God. Look at John. I want to just share a few verses out of John. Look at John 14. John 14, or maybe Ellen will save you all some walking. Um, John 14, 26 says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will do what? He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Y'all got that? Look at John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father... The spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. 
Now look at John 16, verses 12 and 13. I still have many things to say to you, for you cannot bear them now. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. And so when the Holy Spirit came and fell, He was the Spirit of truth. And he would speak to God's holy apostles and prophets the word of God that they needed to share with people. And he would tell them all things that they needed to know. They would remember some of the things that they heard Jesus say face to face. And then they were also given a word for the future, what was going to happen. Aren't you thankful for the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Amen. Amen. And so... All of these men were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Now, the the apostles and the prophets were to speak and write about Jesus. He was their testimony. And by the way, he's our testimony. If we've got a testimony, it's because of Jesus. Right? And so the Holy Spirit gave them remembrance. Uh, The Holy Spirit wrote about, helped them to write about the things that needed to be written down. And now get this, get this, watch this, lean in. I don't want you to miss this. When John, the apostle, finished the book of the Revelation, the foundational work for the church was completed. No more new revelation. Now, you can get more illumination today but no new scriptural revelation. It's been completed. The Bible, you don't need anything else than what we have in the scriptures. The foundational work of, of, of Christ that was carried out by the apostles and prophets has been completed. And, and, and so, well, you remember in, 18, in the 1800s, I don't, I don't remember the exact date, But there was a man who claimed to be a modern day apostle. And he got this vision or his message from some so-called angel and came up with a book that you needed to help explain the Bible. And he called that book the what? The Book of Mormon. That's right. And the name of that so-called modern day prophet was Joseph Smith. Um, and the name of the church? I tell you what, I? Yes. And, and so, I, I don't, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but I want to lovingly tell you, there are no modern day apostles and prophets, at least like there were in the first century. Why? Because their work has been completed. We have everything that we need, scripturally, right here. There is no new revelation. Not now. Not anymore. Now, you know, we've got some stuff to look forward to, don't we? But there's no new revelation right now. We've got everything we need. And so I don't believe in these these, these guys who claim to be, not not in the first century New Testament sense of apostle and prophet. Now, I've got the gift of prophecy. But the modern day gift of prophecy is speaking truth that's already been revealed in the Word of God so that you can, I can make it, when I'm in the Spirit, I can make it palatable enough for you to understand it so that you can do what it says, right? That's the, so I'm not saying that those two gifts are not still available. What I'm saying is those two offices are not because the foundational work of the church has been completed. Are y'all with me? All right. So, now... It also says, let's go back, um, that Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone over there in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. Now, what's that all about? Well, the church rests solidly upon the holy scriptures of the Lord Jesus. He's the foundation itself and he is the chief cornerstone. Now, there's an old Jewish tradition uh, that was given to us from some Jewish historians One of those was a man by the name of Josephus. And Jewish tradition tells us that the the, the Jewish people were building that temple, you know, and it sits up on a mountain, okay? 
And then down below, there's a valley called the Kidron Valley. And there's actually two other valleys. And so the Temple Mount uh, was up on a mountain. And so they would, the Jews were cutting stones for the foundation of, uh, of the temple. And one day, this huge stone was brought up the mountain. And they couldn't, the builders couldn't figure out where it went. It didn't seem to fit anywhere. And so you know what they did with it? According to Jewish tradition, they pushed it off the side of the mountain and it rolled down into the Kidron Valley. And then they completed the foundational work and they were missing a stone. You know what stone it was? The cornerstone. And you see, the cornerstone is what keeps everything else in line. And Jesus, being the chief cornerstone, was rejected by the very people that he came to save. Is that not amazing? And that's scriptural. And so um, 1 Peter 2 and verse 7. Can you throw that one up there, Ellen? 1 Peter 2 and verse 7. Therefore, to, to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Isn't, 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 that, a, isn't that a great story? But having said all of that, let me say it again. The foundational work of God's building has been completed. And, and, and that, that leads me to, say, to this second point this morning. The construction of God's building is continuing. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Are, are y'all getting anything with all this? Or am I just flapping my jaws this morning? Okay. Next time somebody walks up to you and says, Hello, I'm such and such, so and so. You understand where I'm coming from? You just understand, know that I don't believe, I believe everything we've got, everything we need to know about God is written right here. There is no new revelation. And so don't you be hoodwinked by these folks who come on the TV and says, I'm prophet so and so and I'm apostle this or that. I, uh, hello? You wouldn't believe some of the questions I get. You really wouldn't. And I'm like, where have you been? <laughs> Get in the Word of God. That's why Billy, every get in the Word, get in the Word, get in the Bible. All right. The construction of God's building is continuing. While the foundational work has been completed, the construction of this, of this building that, that he's talking about is continuing. Now look at verse 21. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Now, the, uh, the tense of the verbs have changed. Uh, back up in verse 20, that's past, having been built. That's past tense. So that tells you the foundational work of the church has been completed. It's done. Amen? But now the verbs change to present tense in verse 21. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. The construction of God's building is still going on today. Duh. That's what we're doing here, right? I mean, God's building a church. And he's laid the foundation. And we are continuing the construction of that building. Now, did you, now at once the foundation, once the blocks have been laid, what do you do then? Well... When they were building the temple, they started adding stones onto the foundation. And they, they would bring the right stones up, up the mountain and put the stones in place. And so they're building this temple. And the work of God's building the church is still going on. Did you know 1 Peter 2 and verse 4 says that you are a living stone? Look at your neighbor and say, hello, Mr. Stone. Hello, Mrs. Stone. You are a living stone. And what that means is simply this. Once upon a time, we were nothing more than an old rock in the rock quarry of sin. And God's grace reached down and picked us up and began to shape us and size us. And now we are in His building. You are a living stone. Bless God. Um, now... <laughs> God's spiritual building 
is still going up. And, 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 and you're one of the stones. Uh, the word fitted together, listen to this, means everything comes together as one. Being fitted together means everything's coming together for one. Um, look at Ephesians 4, 16. This is a great verse. Ephesians 4, 16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. A church that is growing all fits together. And the word there means multicolored. Uh, <laughs> have you ever stopped to think about what a wonderful building God's church is? And I'm not talking about this structure. I'm talking about you. There are folks here. Some of you are young. Some of you are like me. You're old. Uh, some of you are from this background. Others are you from that background. Some of you are from down south. Some of you are from up north. Some of you, bless God, are from even out west. And God has brought us together. And everything we're doing fits together as one. Why? Because Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Hello? And the Holy Spirit is still at work constructing God's building. The church is expanding. And, and you know, every day God's putting a new stone into his building. Are y'all following that with me? I mean, the church is growing. And, 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 and I, I'm, I don't know how you are, but I want to be a part of something that's alive. And I want to be a part of something that's growing. I want to be a part of something that's going up, that's being edified. And I, I pray every day that, some, that somebody would be added to the church, to the spiritual building of the Lord Jesus Christ. I had the privilege of baptizing Pat Fuller's uh, grandson uh, a couple of weeks ago, and his name was LJ. Um, Leo James, is that right? Um, and, and just, just getting to talk to him and, you know, it's his grandparents, you know, had a lot to do with him being led to the Lord and just getting to talk to him. But I, as they were leaving, I thought there's one more brick in the building. Right. Hallelujah. And that's what this is all about. That's why we're doing what we're doing out of Kenwood. We're trying to see stones, old dead stones come to life and be added to the building. So the construction of God's building is continuing, and I could say a lot more about that, but for time's sake, we'll move on. The habitation of God's building is comforting. Look at verse 22. In whom you also are being built together, there's that word again, for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Why do folks put up a structure like this? Why do they put up a building? So that it might be occupied by people. Well, that's not totally true. The pet palace is right around the corner from my house, and that thing is full of dogs. <laughs> Amen, Bubba? <laughs> um, and, but most of the time, a building is built, and it's going to occupy people, right? And, and, and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is designed for a very unique habitation. Now, in the Old Testament, God dwelt in the tabernacle and later on in the building called the temple. Marvelous structure. And when these two structures were completed, the scriptures tell us that the glory of God filled both places. The glory of God was a visible sign of his presence. Now, when you get to the New Testament, we see God dwelling in four places. And I want you all to, hopefully we're going to crescendo with this, okay? Four different dwelling places that the New Testament tells. First of all, in John 1.14, we see God dwelling in Christ. And the Word was made flesh and what? Dwelt among us. That word dwelt means tabernacled. 
Isn't that cool? Now, y'all, the 11 o'clock crowd will go nuts when I tell them that. So don't let them beat you, okay? The word dwelt means tabernacled. And so that would bring Old Testament pictures in, into their mind. I'm so thankful that Jesus left heaven and came to earth and tabernacled with us. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And, uh, that, that, and John says, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came here so that we might understand and know what God's like. I'm so thankful that He came to dwell with us. And so we see God dwelling in Christ. Uh, and by the way, Colossians 2, 9 makes it real simple. That says, all the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth in Him. Talking about Christ. And then secondly, God also dwells in the Christian. Now, you may not totally understand this, but 1 Corinthians six nineteen says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are. God, God dwells in the Christian today. When you are saved, God takes up residence in your life. There he is. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which is God's. There is a holy habitation going on inside of the believer. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Are you thankful that Christ dwells in you today? In the person of the Holy Spirit? I know I am. Um, and, and so... <clears throat> And, and I love the, to read the Psalms and it talks about how the heavens declare the glory of God. And, and the people saw the presence of God in the tabernacle and the, and the temple. They saw the glory of God. And you know what? Folks ought to see the glory of God in us. I mean, we ought to be so full and so saturated with the Spirit of Almighty God. He's dwelling in us that every now and then, as Brother Shep said, we just ought to let Him slosh out all over everybody around us. Amen? Amen. And so, the people see the glory of God in you. And then, I guess the, we also see God dwelling in the church. Now, as a congregation, we are the temple of God today. Not the build, not this structure, but us. We are, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 reveals that we are God's building. Check that one out there, Ellen. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. There it is right there. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? There's nothing quite like it when God shows up. Amongst his people. His power and glory right smack dab in the middle of the church. We, we've been, we, we constituted as a church about a little over two years ago. March the 25th was our first big grand opening service. But you know there have been some times when the Spirit of God just showed up. The glory of God showed up here. How many of y'all were here? That Wednesday night when Dr. Rock Collins was here and preached. Y'all remember that night? Was just three of y'all here? I w did we tape that? If you want to know what a glory-filled service was like, it was one of those nights. And there have been other times and seasons that God showed up here and dwelt amongst His temple, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the church is where God so often chooses to show off. Little Caitlin Van Bever, that's a prime example. God just chooses sometimes to really show us who He is and give us His glory so that people might be changed. Here's the last one. Did you know that one day God will dwell with His people in a city? I know there's going to be somebody get excited about this. Bound to. Look at Revelation. Look at Revelation 21. Just go to the last page or two of your Bible. I want all y'all to see this. God will dwell one day with His people in a city. 
Revelation 21 and verse 2 says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will, there's that word again, dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. God is building a city where he will dwell with his people. John sees this city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the heavens where we will be in habitation of that city and and God's going to be with us. That's an amazing, amazing truth. We're going to live in a city with God. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? We can only imagine, right? I mean, it is going to be a fabulous city. Now, I don't know if that blesses you today, but it sure does bless me. With all the stuff that's going on around us, with everything that's happening in this nation, God has not forgotten about His people. He is building a city And we are going to dwell with him face to face. And his glory is going to light up that city. There'll be no more trouble then. Hallelujah. All we got to figure out is what kind of praise service are we going to have today? It won't be any issue, right? And you Baptists are going to grin and tap your feet and clap your hands. And you're going to worship in a, Bible says with a, you'll like this, Andrew, with a new song. Uh Uh-oh, that sounds kind of contemporary, old folks. But it won't matter. There's not going to be any worship wars in heaven. There's not going to be anything. Oh, we're going to be so tore up. I think we'll look around and we'll be surprised at who's there. I think we'll look around and be surprised who's not there. And then finally we'll look at ourselves and say, man, I can't believe I'm here. Hallelujah. God will dwell, tabernacle with his people in a city called New Jerusalem. That is heaven and heaven itself. Does that bring you any comfort today? It sure does me. And so God's foundational work of His building has been completed. The construction continues right now, but soon and very soon. Oh, the habitation that we're going to enjoy together is going to be so comforting. And here's the, here's the real deal. Are you in a relationship with Jesus Christ? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that religion saves somebody. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that the way you get your name on the, on the Lamb's book of life is to do good things. The only thing good about Cal Hampton is Jesus. And if you'd be willing today to turn from your sin and simply turn to Christ and place your trust in Him and Him alone to be saved, God, I'm I'm living, God will save anybody. And then, and then look what you have to look forward to. And bless God. I'm having a pretty good time right now. Are y'all? Prove it. Are y'all having a good time now? I mean, not, not, not everything, not everything that happens to us, you know, is jumping up and down for joy stuff. But I, I was talking to Barbara. She, she said something to me, and I said, Sister, I know how you are. She said, What do you mean? I said, You've got joy. And the scripture says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. You see, nobody can take our joy away from us. Because look what we have to look forward to. Amen? I'm, can y'all t- I'm having trouble landing this plane this morning. There's so much I want to say. But I've said all that to say this. Jesus loves you. And he is not done with you. He's going to use you this week for His glory. And you're going to walk out of here today with that glory shine. 
But you know what you need to do on Wednesday night? That glory shine will have faded a little bit. You need to get online on our Facebook Live Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. I'll be glad when we can get that done down here again. And then you go on and shine again for Jesus until Sunday. And then you get a little bit more of that glory. Y'all get what I'm talking about? Let's pray. Father, it just blows me away to think that you dwell in your temple today of the Holy Spirit. You dwell in us. You take up residence in our heart and in our spirit. And there are, there are seasons and times when you, your manifest presence just shows up and fills the house with your glory. What a, what a dangerous request. Lord, could I see your glory today? Would we see your glory? Father, I submit that that's what the church needs today. We need revival. Desperately, we need revival. And would you show up and show out here amongst your people so that others might see your glory in us. I don't know what you want to do with this message, but God, I've delivered it the best way I know how. So would you use it today for your honor and praise. And God, I thank you for that city whose builder and maker is God. And we're headed that direction. If there's one here that doesn't know where he or she's going, oh, today, God, today, that you'd make a living stone out of an old dead rock that's in the rock quarry of sin. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.